This is dedicated to anyone that's been knocked down, but not out. The ones that fell to their knees, but rose back up. The ones that scratched and clawed, but never let go. The ones willing to admit their faults, move past their failures, and improve every single day. I hope these conversations encourage you to think critically, make you laugh hysterically, inspire you profoundly, and remind you to practice gratitude daily. My name is Iman Hushman. Welcome to the conversation. Welcome to Awesome People. What's going on, awesome people? Welcome to another podcast of Awesome People. It's been a long time since I've had the pleasure of having a virtual chit chat with all of you and having a special guest. So I can't wait to get to the introduction of this amazing guest that we have today. But before that, for those of you who've never watched an episode of Awesome People, uh, it's very simple. I like to have authentic conversations with the most awesome versions that I've had the pleasure of seeing from afar or have known in person. And today's guest is no different, um, which I'll lead into in just a few seconds. But Awesome People is really part of the larger umbrella brand that we have, which is Unite and Conquer. And our mission at Unite and Conquer is to unite Persians, especially English speaking Persians, as somebody who never had the great privilege of living or being born in Iran. Uh, I've always felt the sense of wanting to belong to uh, our culture and our history and our people. And, you know, however way fate has it, we didn't live there. We didn't grow up there, but we're here now. But there's still an opportunity to connect to our fellow Persians and honestly um, celebrate the most awesome Persians that we have uh, on Earth. And my guest today is certainly one individual that I've admired, respected and kind of seen from afar and seen how she has been escalating uh, in the world of health and wellness and uh you know, honestly, putting out a lot of positivity in the world. And that's really what the world needs more than ever. And so I'm I'm really excited and happy that this comeback episode, you know, it's been a few months for those of you who've been following the podcast, that this comeback uh, episode is with none other than Dr. Mona Van. So instead of giving a long bio, I'd like for her to just come on to the screen and she can kind of give a little bit of backstory of who she is and why she is uh, awesome. Person. So without any further ado, I'd like to welcome uh, Dr. Mona Van. Mona John, how are you? I'm great. How are you? Thank you so much for joining me. I believe you're in New York uh, nowadays, right? I am. I'm in New York City now. Hopefully things have warmed up a little bit to kind of match the LA vibe that you've been accustomed to uh, most of your life. It, it's, back, it's been like the coldest spring ever, but it's okay. I've gotten used to it here. I'm, I'm originally from the DC area. I'm in Miami now, but uh, I, I heard that up Northeast, it's still a little bit chilly. So hopefully uh, yes. summer will you come around or maybe you enjoy the crispy cold uh, spring a little bit too, you know? I do a little bit, which is weird because I never used to like it, but you kind of adapt to it when you when you live here. That's right. And I'll definitely get into um, how you've adapted to New York in a little bit. But for those who haven't had the pleasure of, of knowing who Mona Vand is, would you mind in your own words kind of just explaining a little bit of your backstory and the personality aspect as well? Yeah. So um, I was born in upstate New York, in Albany, New York. Um, my parents were both born in Iran, grew up in Iran. They got married um, there and their plan was to just come to the U.S. for education and then go back to live in Iran. Because, um, you know, as you know, when they grew up there, it was a very different country, um, you know, very different than what people know of it now. The golden years. So <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, and when it was the Paris of the Middle East. That's right. So they came to the U.S. and the reason they were in upstate New York, my dad was getting his PhD at a college called RPI for engineering. Um, they went through a divorce and me and my brother were very young. I was like two or three and he was like four or five. Um, interesting, actually, they sent us to Iran for a year to live with our grandparents because it was just a, it was a very complicated situation. So I actually did live in Iran, but I was such a young age. But I believe it or not, have so many like random little memories that I just have stayed in my head. You were there, um, you were there so for when, just one year? 11 months, oh, 11. yes. Okay, all right. But I was so young. I was three and four. But like, I remember celebrating my birthday. I remember going to the market with my grandmother. I remember what their house looked like. So you do have memories from that age. I noticed, um, I noticed you had a beautiful picture of you and your grandparents in one of your Instagram posts. So yeah, go oh, ahead. Continue. I love them. Continue, I love them so much. Continue with your memories. Go ahead. <laughs> um, so, we, so then we came back and my dad and brother moved to L.A., 
and my, me and my mom stayed in New York. So I grew up with my mom in upstate New York where there were no Iranians. I mean, not really much culture at all. I, I was maybe one of three ethnic kids and I would travel to LA all the time to visit my dad and brother and just kind of crave being there because, you know, there were other Iranians and I felt there's, you know, there's just this like soul connection you have when you hear Persian music or go to a Persian restaurant. And, but it was always kind of like this, Oh, I wish I was more Persian because they all grew up together and speak Farsi and I don't speak it anymore. But then it was like, I wish I was more white when I was in New York because I was so different. So I definitely know that feeling of like not really knowing where you belong. Right. And so you, you, how long were you playing this bicoastal life? All through high school. And then pretty much when I hit like 14, 15, I was like, I'm going to live in LA. I want to go to LA for college. But, you know, my parents kind of pushed me into pharmacy school and I didn't know what I wanted to do then. You know, it's like doctor, lawyer, engineer. Mm. So I, um, the, the school in Boston was just a better program for me. It was a direct, and I was like, okay, let me get a little like experience somewhere else. I immediately regretted it. I wanted to be in LA so badly, but I spent <laughs> the, the six cold, years. I was the like, cold bus Boston winter. Was that a regrettable moment? <laughs> yes. And I was like, I wanted to be at USC and like, I wanted to be in the sun. Um, but as soon as I graduated, I was like, see, ya, and I moved to LA. <laughs> so, so basically, is it fair to say that you had zero interest in pharmacy or was there a little bit, but you just couldn't see yourself as like a career pharmacist? I actually had no idea what I wanted to do. I mean, I was the one who in second grade was like, I'm going to be a pediatrician because, you know, your parents were Persian. Like they're like doctors, like the, you know, praised thing. Um, when my mom suggested pharmacy school for me, she was like, it's a good job for women. You know, when you get pregnant and you have a baby, you can work two or three days a week. And there was no social media. There was no creativity. I actually wanted to be a news anchor and they were like, no, that's not going to work. <laughs> So, you know, and I think at that, that mentality for Persian parents is like, you have to get a specific degree that's going to make you money. You need to make money. And I didn't know any better. So when I was studying pharmacy, I actually really liked learning about health and wellness. And I, I was excited. And then as soon as I started working, I hated it. So that was where I had the like, oh God, this isn't for me. So, I mean, it's interesting how you said, because I remember I was watching one of the interviews and you said pretty much on day one as a pharmacist, you were crying. And literally, I, I um, before I went to actually business school and I started my entertainment company, I went to physical therapy therapy school. So there was like a doctor of physical therapy school and I was miserable every single day. And it, it pained me to break the news to my parents that, hey, your son is not going to become this doctor of physical therapy. I'm sorry. Um, my question to you is, how did you make it through those six years of doctorate degree of uh, or pharmacy? Was it miserable every single day or was it a balance? Like sometimes you enjoyed certain aspects of it and, you know, just kind of tell me a little, unpack that for me. Yeah. You know, so the good thing about my school is that it was a health science school. So like there was no regular college. If I went to USC, I probably would have been like, what am I doing? You know, but the, every, everyone everyone was studying all the time. My class was so small. We were all studying the same things and I actually liked it. Like I, I, I mean, I obviously love health and wellness. I, I think that's when my like interest and passion started developing. And, you know, I was like, I'm going to make $120,000 a year when I graduate. Like I didn't know what anything about life, like I was so sheltered. So I was just excited to like make this good salary. And, um, I was interested in what I was learning. And to be honest, I still think about things I learned. I actually luckily liked the topics. It just was the job that I didn't like. Right. Um, so it seems like, and I don't want to put words in your mouth, but you said you like journalism and then you like parts of pharmacy. Well, no, and, Oh. You want to... <laughs> I wanted, I wanted to be, I wanted to be on television. Oh, okay. <laughs> like All right. So you wanted to be in pharmacy. I just wanted to be on, <laughs> yes, I liked media. <laughs> yeah. So, and, and I think in, in one of the interviews I watched, you know, you actually, uh, there was like a Marky Costello that you kind of went and studied it and kind of got your foot into the door yes. and how did, so you, yes. you know, you, you had an interest, you, you did the smart thing, which is, you know, learn about it and be acclimated to it. And then you had obviously the, the foundational aspect, which is the educational. And so it seems yep. like, you know, you kind of created the path that you are uh, at now, you know, but probably not knowing it at the time that every little step yes. that you were going through. So kind of tell us about that journey and how, like, when you look back at it now, how is it? How does it feel to be where you are now with having a community of over two million people that are, uh, you know, looking up to you to kind of not just provide them with educational and health content, but doing it in a very cool, modern, you know, uh, you know, just... Uh, technology savvy thank kind of way. Thank you. And um, thank you for even knowing the market Costello. That's such a, that's a great detail. Um, 
you know, when I, so I started working as a pharmacist and was like, I mean, I cried the first day because I had this gut feeling like I'm stuck. I've got all these student loans. This is, it was more a feeling of like, oh my God, this is life. It was this really deep, profound moment. I swear where I was like, is this my life now? Like I have one week of vacation, like I'm stuck. It was horrible. So I, I kept, first I kept job switching different pharmacies and then it was really like Dr. Oz. I remember seeing him being like, okay, why can't I be that expert? And I actually, because I was in LA, my very first friend was a news anchor on KTLA news. And she was like, you should, you're, you're like, you're so cute. You should come on when it's like flu season, you should be the expert. And I was like, can I make this into a career? So this is before Instagram really popped off. And I was like, okay, this is what I'm going to do. So my first path was like, I need to learn how to host. So that's when I went to Marky Costello and she was talking about branding before anyone really knew what branding was. So then I learned that. And in the, like, you know, meanwhile, while I was trying to build this website and host, I saw Instagram growing and I saw this opportunity where I was like, okay, there's these beauty bloggers talking about skincare. Maybe I can talk about it and like have that extra edge. So it ended up working out my degree, you know, like I did, I do have an interest in what I studied, which I mean, lucky for me, it didn't fully go to waste. You know? <laughs> no, definitely not. You wasted nothing. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. you, know, you mentioned branding and like, you know, you have an incredible brand. It's such a clean brand. Again, it's it caters to a younger, well, I mean, you know your demographic better, but it's basically to the times, you know, and you obviously have a great team with Julia and Erica on your side, and I'm sure many people behind the scenes that make it all happen. But tell mm-hmm. me about this journey of creating your brand and what type of advice you have for people who, it might not be your industry, but maybe your industry, but in general, the whole idea of, I got to clean up my brand. I got to clean up the messaging. If you can kind of share a little bit about your experience about building your brand. Um, it's actually changed. So it's funny because I've, I've been lucky enough to have a lot of really great mentors and people who have been in the industry for years, whether in the music industry or, or actors or, and I remember getting advice from some people who were older and kind of seasoned. And I, there's this one moment where I was doing, um, my first like talk and I remember posting on, this is like, you know, years ago I posted, this is my first one. I'm excited. And I remember him being like, don't tell people that you have to all like fake it till you make it, you know? (laughs) And that was kind of, but, but now I actually don't believe in that where now people crave authenticity and it's like, Hey, like, you know, so there's, I think that the world of media was a lot different then. And that's what I was following at first was like, you know, I have to present this like specific brand and always look perfect. And I do still believe in like, I like beauty. Like I love beautiful things. I like my content to look beautiful. I like, I like, I I like dressing nice. So that's just me authentically. But I think being yourself is really what carries you now. I think that times have changed and it doesn't have to be so like, I'm a physical object. I think people just, you know, like your personality more. And you know what? I think, uh, I think I read or saw somewhere, but this whole white lab coat thing, it's like, it just wasn't you. And you're like, I don't want this. And I was looking at a, like a six, six years ago, it was you and Lily Galici. And, you know, yes, you're, you're, I'm wearing it. Yeah, you're like wearing it. And I was like, I can sense that she just does not feel comfortable there. I mean, like, it was a great interview. Don't get me wrong. But I just, I, when, no, I, com- when yes. I compare it to you now, I'm like, she's just herself now. And then back then, she was trying to figure out who she was. So it was kind of cool looking at your evolution of, of yes. really not even just your brand, it's just more of you know so that's cool 100 percent. i took the doctor off because i was like i i felt so i always felt like this is the only value i can bring like i have like people need to only hear this from me whereas like yeah. maybe i didn't feel like i had enough so like i didn't have enough else to offer as myself yeah and um i remember even if you google me like one of the first it's like on yahoo finance it's just like the cheesiest photo with this lab coat and i'm like oh my god cringe cringe <laughs> even at the pharmacy i couldn't like <laughs> that it's just not for me. Like I would wear black yoga pants and like throw on a lab coat with like a hoodie under it. Like I just could not get myself there. Uh, But, but let me ask you this. So now, you know, you went through this journey, you found yourself, you found your authentic self and that's what you do your best to project obviously in a nice, clean professional, not professional, but like a, 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 a nice way, but Clean. Not, I, I clean. like a clean look. Minimalistic how clean. I dre- yeah. I have a minimalistic style, hundred yeah. percent. And it's awesome. Mm-hmm. And, 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 and now you've amassed, 2 million plus uh, communities. So the, it's a two-part question. The first question is, 
Like, that's a lot of responsibility. You know how they say with a lot of power comes a lot of responsibility, Super, you know, Spider-Man or whatever the hell it is. But, like, first mm-hmm. of all, like, I, you know, when you put out a message, especially things that have to do with health, you know, like, everything that you put out, people are going to dissect it, you know? And, and, and you know, there's, sometimes there's different opinions about certain things about health. How have you been able to, like, handle the pressure of having 2 million people that are uh, criticizing you, analyzing you, um, and just a responsibility as a pharmacist and a, and a health professional to convey uh, these important messages? You know, like, I've had people make videos on YouTube just to, like, talk bad about me, about a video I've done that that have gotten hundreds of thousands of views. You know, like, these are, like, big YouTubers that... um. And, you know, that's kind of what their whole channel is, is like, you know, trying mm. to put some... <laughs> as, they say, but, as they say in Farsi, certo pert, but go ahead. I don't know how good your Farsi <laughs> is, but okay. That, it's, it's mediocre. What does that mean? <laughs> certo pert means like trash TV, trash content, you know? Exactly. You know, I have a, I have a pet peeve. If, if Exactly. It's clickbait. And it, I would never, ever create something to put someone else down. Like, that's just like, you know, it's like, I'm focused on myself. Yeah. Um, but it was really hard. Like those were, you know, you feel that cause then everyone else starts attacking you. And especially when all you're trying to do is like put out something good into the world. So I think in terms of health and wellness, you know, you have to, like, I definitely had a lawyer in the beginning, like give me all my disclaimers. Like this is for entertainment purposes only, you know, you have to make sure the advice you're giving people always consult with their own doctor. But One thing that I've done now that's uh, really helped me is like, this is what I do. I try to really make it more personal versus like, this is what you should do. Mm -hmm. I also don't want to tell anyone what to do. Like, this is what works for me. This is what I like. But people, I mean, you know, people are just kind of ready to take their anger out on you or like to call you out on something. So it's, it's definitely a lot. Well, so I feel like, um, You've, you've kind of become accustomed to it, but I'm sure in the very beginning, it did kind of bog you down. I mean, I would assume because you're a human. Definitely. Um, like, how, can, can you kind of take me to like some of the darker days or some of the things that like you would read? And like, again, you're human, so I wouldn't blame you. So like, how, what would you do to kind of snap out of it and be like, you know what? I can't deal with this. I don't want to deal with it. I need to get over it. What did you have to go through to kind of combat this, this criticism, this hate? No, it was usually just like leaning on like family or friends. Like I would get kind of down on it. Like my brother would help a lot. Um, you know, the people in my life, like would always, you know, it doesn't matter. And I, I've definitely become a much more spiritual person over the last couple of years. So in the beginning, it was just seeing it as like, oh, these people, like they're, they're, they're such assholes. Like what, you know, it was always putting them down. Whereas now don't get me wrong. It's still like, it's still like a zing, especially when someone points out something you're already insecure about. Like that's hard, you know, and someone's just like digging at you. Um, but now I've really shifted for the most part to like, I, this person is so unhappy, you know, like if someone's really taking time out of their day to focus on you, that's already like, you know, like they, they obviously aren't that interested in their own lives where they're so focused on something you're doing and then to spew negativity, like they must have so much sadness and anger and hurt inside. So I try to just kind of, you know, okay, let it be. Empathy. It's like a little zing. Yes. But it, you know, it, it, it rolls off much easier now. It doesn't, it's still hurtful in the moment. I, I hope to one day get to a point where I'm, you know, it doesn't even hurt me, but it definitely still does sometimes. It definitely, it definitely shouldn't. And, and honestly, I feel like in comparison, I don't see that much negativity on your pages anyway. So if it's worth anything, like Correct. when you yeah. compare it, it's, it seems like you have a lot of love, a lot of support from, from the entire community. Actually, a lot of appreciators. You saying that is a good point because that was one thing that would always, you, you're so focused on yourself and you're like, oh my God, everyone's going to read this. Mm -hmm. This is so like embarrassing. And then you go, everyone has it on their own page. No, you know what I mean? Like everyone's getting it. So no one's as focused on you as you think. Um, So you mentioned spirituality and I was watching also something that, uh, you, not not that you have a surprising friendship with this individual, but I was surprised that this person was so zen, and that is Russell Simmons, a hip hop mogul. Yeah. And you know, it's you know, you you had such a great conversation with him, and you were sharing something, and his 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 messaging was, or his message to you was so profound, so calming. Um, tell me more about spirituality. It doesn't have to be about Russell, but in general, how has spirituality helped you? How has he perhaps helped you? I don't know about the whole backstory, but I know you were friends at a time. So share some more. Yes, we, well, you know, I think my family's technically Muslim, but I didn't grow up with any religion. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, even growing up, like I, everyone in Marnie was Catholic. I would go to church with my friends sometimes if I was spending the night at their house. Like, you know, I always believed in a God, but never really had anything organized. And 
Um, Russell and I first met because we met at a party because he was wearing a, a yoga, hot eight yoga t-shirt, which was where I just started going to yoga. So I talked to him um, and, you know, when someone's older, they've lived so much more life and they're, they've got like a wiseness to them. Mm -hmm. So, um, I was always really like, you know, when he speaks, it's very inspiring, very beautiful, very uplifting. So I'd always love to hear his perspective on life. And that's how our friendship started. Um, but in terms of even that, that's even been like years coming. I think even COVID really pushed me more towards it. I actually found Joe Dispenza's work and he, do you know anything about him? I don't know. He is really incredible because he talks a lot about energy, um, but in a very scientific way. So I'm, I'm like, I need facts. I need to see the science. I want to see proof for me to believe. I've never really been able to just like follow my intuition on things like that. And um, he just, I mean, the research team is at UC San Diego. Like this is like real Western medicine, just showing facts about like how, you know, we're more energy than matter. Like we're frequency and just showing like how it medically can affect you and, and I think as I like got so fascinated with that, I started studying it more. And it, I feel like meditation and energy just gives you like a faith in something without having to be religious, you know, like, you know, there's something that's this higher power in the universe and everything's just, just has its destiny and everything is exactly as it should be. So it almost just gives you like a calming, I guess, way to go about life. Yeah. And I think that uh, recently you, you, speaking of calming and probably a lot of spirituality, you did one year off of social media, at least to some degree. Yep. And then if I'm not mistaken, you did like a silent retreat, which for me is like, holy crap, how the hell does anybody do that? Especially yeah. somebody like you who is like living off of this connectivity. So uh, t tell people, first of all, exactly how this past year was and especially a silent retreat and then your experience and what came out of it. So I, I actually was, um, the reason I took a break was because I just found myself not really happy with, with like my work and it, it wasn't fun anymore. And like, I was obsessed with my work in the beginning and I felt like it felt like a little bit more of like a rat race. Like I had to get this many posts up here and, and I didn't, I wasn't connecting to the content, I guess. Like it was almost like I was kind of transitioning into more of what I do now. And actually my boyfriend was like pushing me and, you know, this is like his world. Like he's, he knows so much about it. And I was like, everyone's going to forget about me. I can't take a break. And he really kind of calmed me and he's like, I promise you, you could take two years off and like your life is going to be fine. Like just do what you have to. Like, so at first it was like, I'm just going to take two months off and come back. And then two months just like, you know, turned into a year where every time I went to go back and do it, you know, I just, I, it was like pulling teeth. I didn't want to do it. So I guess I just kind of listened to my, and, and I got a lot of anxiety at certain points. Like am I missing the mark? Everyone else is like out there hustling. What am I doing? But I just kept listening to my intuition to not do it. And I actually went in January to Joe Dispenza's week long. He had like a seven day oh, wait, hold on. advanced I, retreat. I do know Joe Dispenza. No, I, now, yes. uh, he's, he's got a wife and a couple of kids that just he'd recently had. No, he has grown kids. Okay, maybe I miss it, but I, now the name actually sounds familiar. I just, but okay, sorry to cut you off. <laughs> no, it's okay. I went. Um, his week long was much more relaxed than a silent retreat, like you know. Um, and after it, I just I felt like it was almost like this energy opened up in me that had been stuck for so long. I felt this kind of like freedom. I don't know, and I remember just being like, you know, this is what I want to do. I want to. The two girls on my team now, they were moving. They're you know my two of my best friends from LA, they were moving to New York. And I was like, I want them to work with me. This is, I was so clear and just got like re-inspired and started. And it was, it was amazing. So now I'm like more excited and inspired than ever to just kind of rebrand in like a more authentic way. And, you know, it really didn't do anything. Like you think a year off is going to be a big deal. I'm, I'm right back to where I was, like I'm moving along and it really gave me a detachment from my phone, which has just been the best thing ever. Like I, it could be in the other room and I don't care. And, and, but you, and you actually did like a multi-day complete silent retreat too, like no talking or what? Yes. Was How long was that? So the, that, that was, um, I, so after I did the Joe Dispenza, like he teaches you how to meditate. There's one meditation we do for four hours. And I was like, oh, this 10 day silent retreat is going to be so easy. Like I'm a pro at this point. <laughs> and I wanted to do it because I had heard other people do it. And then I was like, you know, I'm so hooked on Joe's meditations. I kind of want to, I don't want to be, I don't want to like stick to one person. Like mm. I don't want, you know, I want, I want to be able to do my own thing, but that one, I'm not going to lie. was really, really hard. Um, 
I think it wasn't the right choice for me at the time. The silent part was actually really easy because, you know, I mean, the silent part I actually got, I think, some benefit out of because waking up and just having breakfast, like by yourself, not looking at, I felt like I was digesting better. It was so peaceful. Like I really liked my breakfast every morning, but I think the environment and being alone and um, just, that part of it was really, really hard. The meditations were hard. It was just, it was difficult. I'm not going to lie. How many days was this? I'm very curious about this. 10 days. Holy crap. Okay. So for 10 days, like when you were in your room, did you just talk out loud to yourself just to kind of Well, like... so just, okay. So this is Vipassana and you actually could talk to the teachers. If you had a question, oh, you just okay. couldn't talk. to. So like I talked every day for at least five or 10 minutes. So I'd be like, Hey, like I'm, I'm feeling this or whatever. So you could talk a little bit. Um, that helped. What, what, like, what was the best thing that you walked away with having done 10 days of this type of silent retreat? I was definitely very clear. Like I, we were, I'm, you know, there's a new TV show idea that I was going to pitch right before I went on the 10 day. And then when I was there, I thought of a completely new, I'd been wanting to do the show for a year and a half. I was dead set on it. And then in the 10 days, I thought of a completely new show that is like a million times better. And I thought of a lot of different things. Like, I just felt like I was very creative. Um, it's actually indirectly really impacted me because I think it was so intense that when I left, I was like, why don't I do that to myself? And I think I was like, I don't need to be so rigid on myself. Like, I don't like, why did I, like, why not just like do a three day or something? Like, why did I feel like I had to go to this 10 day thing? So as of right now, I'm still waiting for other benefits to pour in, but it was, it was really intense. I wish I had something more insightful to share from no, that. No, that's fine. I mean, that's your honest feedback that it was a little bit yeah. too much that you don't need to kind of put yourself to that type of perhaps torture. Uh, exactly. For, for that long. Uh, speaking of shows and series, uh, I, I know that your team mentioned that you're working on something this summer, mm -hmm. like a girl talk series. I don't know yes. how much you're able to divulge, but I'm sure that if it's coming out this summer, it's something that uh, you're excited about, you're passionate about. So tell us as much as you can, please. That one, that one's going to be for YouTube. So that one I'm excited about. I can share. Um, we're basically just coming up with this uh, series called Girl Talk. So it's just going to be five. So me and the two girls on my team, and then we're doing two different girls each episode. Mm -hmm. And we just want it to be girl talk, like what girls talk about, like dating or life or, I mean, working, like, you know, having kids or do not want kids fun stuff. And it's good because the two of them are both single. So just, you know, sharing their like every, you know, week multiple dates is so much fun and we're going to make it into just like a little mini series and see how it does i'm kind of into doing like let's do it like six episodes and mm -hmm. see if it takes off and then if not we can you know adjust is to do something else not, not to uh put you on the spot here but is it like kind of like a pilot to a potential podcast is that kind of like a little test you know they actually talked about maybe a i'm actually launching a podcast with one of my really close friends oh, separately great. okay um we we just started it probably won't launch until this summer um okay. So I don't know that I'd want to do two, but you never know. Look, if, if, I feel like it, that's what's fun and creative. Like, I think I used to be so careful of what I put out there. And I think it's if for anyone who wants to be a creator. I think it's a lot smarter to just not care about the judgment. Just put things out and see what grabs. Keep yeah. trying different things until something works. Of course. All right. So so now, now, if you don't mind, let's transition to like one of your most popular videos on YouTube. Speaking of YouTube is... I actually watched it yesterday and I'm on a mission to create my own smoothies now in the morning. <laughs> but uh, but t tell me about, you know, routines. And I, I know you said you don't want to tell people what to do. So share what it is that has worked so well for you. And um, I'm sure it's also like evolutionary, like, you know, what might have been what you did a couple of years ago changes now. So right yes. now, what does how does Mona Van start her day, both, you know, just in a regular way and also food wise, if you don't mind sharing? Nope. Um, I wake up and my phone's on airplane while I sleep. Um, and then I wake up and I immediately meditate. So I don't turn my phone on. I have usually like the guided meditation downloaded. That's like an hour and 20 minutes, hour and 15 wow, minutes. Wow, That's long. Yeah. I, I do a pretty long, some days I'll do a 20 or 30 minute one, but the ones that I do are pretty long. Um, so I'll do that. And then I, you know, I'll at least turn my phone on, but I will, go and like make tea. I'll usually like right after turn on, sometimes I'll journal immediately, like things I thought about during my meditation. I'm not like a big journaler, like in general, but if I'm like, okay, this was a profound thought, I'll jot it down. Um, then I'll turn on Alexa 
and I'll make tea. And I literally like dance around the kitchen in my room for like a solid 15 minutes. Like it's so much fun. It gets me in the best what, mood what every type, day. What type of music? We need to know the genre at least, if not, right? if not artists and songs. I'm a, so I'm a big house music fan, but that's not what I, in the morning, sometimes I'll do Kygo, like, oh yeah, Kygo, hell yeah. Like, like especially Kygo if you play love. the ones with videos, like of like, you know, if you go on YouTube and you put Kygo remixes, there's like an hour of video of like tropical places with Kygo yes, remixes. Yes, tropical house. It's incredible. Exactly. Yes. Okay. Okay. I also love the weekend. Save your tears by the weekend. Oh, it's hell yeah. I, I, I the, love the weekend. The one, with, <laughs> the one with Ariana Grande, like their live performance. Oh. Ariana's incredible. If you can get me oh, to on the podcast i would really appreciate it anyway, <laughs> right. uh, but yeah. i don't know her unfortunately <laughs> um so i'll listen to those i'll dance around yeah. um and then i'll like some mornings i work out i'm not like religious about working out so it depends on the day um and i usually won't eat until like 10 or 11 so then i'll just is get this, ready is for this the breakfast day. too because in one of the videos you mentioned breakfast one and breakfast two kind of stuff is that so yeah, so yes, I still do breakfast one and two because my breakfast one is always a fruit or produce. And I like to wait like 20 minutes to let it digest fruit. You should always have on an empty stomach. Um, even, you know, whether you follow food combining, I've, I've noticed a lot of different cultures, even my grandmother, like, you know, she knows our grandparents know so much about food. I swear. I'm like, was there like an Iranian, like ancient wisdom school? Cause like, I don't understand. They just know everything. Um, so my fruit, my fruits always, the thing I'm doing differently now is I'm stewing my fruit because it really helps the digestion. So that's, I've lo- I'll just cook it a little bit with some cinnamon and water and I'll have that. Um, and then I'll go for something else depending on what my mood is. Um, but I always like to start with like, there's something about starting with produce. It's like your body's just fasted all night. It's like a clean slate. I want something very pure to go in first thing in the morning. Okay, so still lemon and water and cayenne pepper and and like the vinegar one is still good and then like a little smoothie. That's still afterwards. good. Okay. Yep, the lemon and cayenne like it depends. I don't I don't do it every day, but lemon lemon water if is one of the best things to have in the morning. If you know, whether it's with cayenne or not. Got it. All right. And then what about like when you wind down in the evening? Like what's a good uh, meal to have before you call the night so that overnight things digest properly, etc.? You know, it's whatever you eat, it, you know, depends on your diet, but I would say to give yourself at least three hours before going to bed to digest your food. So I like to eat, I mean, on a perfect night, I like to finish eating by seven. Of course, when we're going out to dinner, it's not really like a social thing. Um, but I like to finish eating and then go to bed by like 10 or 11 so that I can digest. Um, if I'm like craving something later, I swear tea with like a little cinnamon or decaf coffee or something will crave, like curb my hunger. Um, but I, I, I like intermittent fasting, like at least 12 hours minimum, but you know, some days 16 between dinner and breakfast. If, if you were to go out to a restaurant, um, what, what, like for dinner, what's the healthiest meal that you can have that is pretty much available everywhere? I'm, I'm, I'm basically, I'm on a mission to get myself in a leaner, healthier way. And my girlfriend loves to go Mm -hmm. out to restaurants and like. I feel like the the natural thing for somebody who doesn't know shit about this kind of stuff is like a salmon salad or something like yep. that. But what what do you think? What would you have? You know, if salmon is one of the lowest mercury fish, so even I I mean, wild fish is going to be your best. If I see wild salmon or like wild cod, I'm like, that's a no brainer because <laughs> it's just it's going to be the healthiest thing. Um, if it's not wild, you kind of have to just go based off the rest of the menu. Um, I like to like look. My thing is like I'll look at a menu. I'll see what foods they offer on any item. Like, let's say there's like a sweet potato something or like a cucumber salad. What like I'm like, okay, I know they have this in the kitchen. I know they have this in the kitchen. So I'll see the items, and sometimes I'll ask them to throw something together. Like, not too complicated, but you could start with a really basic salad and add on. Like, can you do like um, boiled sweet potatoes? Add cucumber. Add beets, and you know, and you can make this into like a really filling. So meal. basically, you or go like, into the back kitchen and you start making your own meal. Huh? Basically, basically. <laughs> the, the waiters <laughs> love you. <laughs> it sounds complicated, but it's really not. It's like start with the thing that's most similar. Add two or three things, but yeah. I would say like a wild fish and vegetables. But let me give you one tip on vegetables Tell because me. oils are like a really like kind of make or break thing. And if they're like cooking in high heat olive oil, or if they're using canola oil or seed oils, it's actually very inflammatory. Mm. So if you want to go healthier there, what you could do is just ask them to steam it and then ask for a side of olive oil and lemon and just pour, 
having it cold is great, but yeah. when they cook it at high heat, it's when it can, you know, produce carcinogens and toxins. So I like to do that too. That's actually very uh, helpful feedback right there. And mm. it looks like the tip that I have to give the waiter is going to have to increase if I'm going to ask him to uh, do all these. Just be things. nice and smile <laughs> and, and <laughs> I'll appreciate it. I will. I actually like one thing that you said in one of your quotes, speaking of food and stuff, you said eating well and exercising is a form of self-respect. I just, I genuinely, um, it resonated with me a lot because now everything that I'm looking at, I'm like, Iman, do you do you respect yourself? <laughs> Should you really be having this? But can in you, a positive can, way, though, right? Yeah, no, of course, no, definitely. Yes. I mean, like my mindset was already shifting in the past month. One of my friends were having like a daily one hour go walk run challenge, and 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 now I'm like, you know what? It's a diet that is like 70, 80 percent of 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 the importance here. So I'm really now shifting towards diet. So there's a reason why I reach out to you is because selfishly, I'm really trying to do whatever I can to live a healthier um, life and diet is one of them. But tell me a little mm -hmm. bit more about eating well and exercising as a form of self-respect. You know, I think like we go through so much of life unconscious, you know, we're like walking, we're not paying attention to, we don't even like, we're just putting food in our mouth, we're doing things and we're, and our mind really plays tricks on us because we tell ourselves like, just take it easy, you deserve it. Like just enjoy it, live your life. But like, really like you have this one body, it's your temple and you really want, I mean, treating it well, like let it serve you the best it can. Like this is, this is supposed to carry you all through life. So you're just doing good for yourself. Like I always tell people like, who cares about what you look like then? Right. Don't you want to be able to like run around with your grandkids? Don't you want to feel good? Like when you get older, that's really what it's about, you know? So I think when you shift that, like, I just, when I look at food, I look at it, like, is this going to nourish me? Like, how is this, how is this going to like feel in my body? And look, of course I get cravings. Like when there's French fries around, I, I can't like, that's my, that's my <laughs> biggest thing. I love French fries. Um, but what I, I like to make, I like to have my like unhealthy foods at home because I can find a way, like, I don't care about the calories and French fries, but I don't want it like, you know, deep fried in unhealthy oil. Like the, any fat you eat, just so you know, every like, most of your body and most of your cells, like all of your cells are made up of fat. So it actually gets etched into your brain because your brain is made up of so much fat. So when you eat an unhealthy fat, like it, be it becomes part of you. So that's one thing that I'm like a really weird about, but I'll get potatoes and avocado oil and fry them at home. You know, something that's good at high heat, or I'll make like a Mac and cheese with like a cashew cheese sauce or something. I'll, I'll get my fixes at home. And then when I'm out, I try to eat clean. Do you have a YouTube video up or a TikTok video about the Mac and cheese one? Yes, I do. Okay. I have to go. I find think I, I might have it on Instagram too, but I definitely have a TikTok. Uh, and uh, my TikTok is <laughs> under recipes. You can find it. I'll go check it out for sure. Cause Mac and cheese is definitely yeah. one of my vices. Um, Who doesn't love it? So speaking of uh, living longer and healthier, there's a book that I read recently, which I absolutely love. And I think it's a very famous book. Have you read Ikigai? No. Ikigai. So basically, it's a story about how these authors, I forget the author's name, but there's a place in Japan that has the highest uh, percentage of centennials um, in like per capita. So like they all find out why, how are these people living over 100 blue years? Blue zone? Um, is that what it's called? The blue zone? But you, I think like I, I'm if blue zone is like the blue zones of parts of the world I where think, people are living the longest oh, and healthiest. So it, it, actually, you know what? Now that Maybe. you say it, um, I think that there was a mention of that being the blue zone. But the book is called Ikigai, okay. which is basically purpose, you know, and Japanese mm -hmm. people, they never retire. Well, at least the ones in that island, particularly, they, they don't really retire because they have this purpose and they keep on working until physically they're not able to. And then, of course, you know, like the, the healthy aspect, what they eat and then also sense of community being able to basically go in a village and being able to be of service to each other and helping each other. And so this whole combination of working out, eating well, uh, drinking well, is all the signs of, you know, it leads to longevity in life, you know, but most importantly, wow. Ikigai purpose. I highly recommend if you like to read a good book, it's a short read, uh, a three hour audible, but uh, it's a bestseller. So it's definitely very popular, but um, I w I'm definitely good. I, yeah. I'm a listener. I, it's funny. I actually do not like reading, but I love listening. So yes. I'm gonna listen to yeah, it. no, me too. For me, on my walks, I I, I watch it. And I put yes. it on like 1.4 speed, so it goes a little bit faster. Um, oh, smart. But yeah, so no, Ikigai, I K I G A I, uh, great Got book. It. But uh, but yeah, so and speaking of which, you, you have like a little cookbook as well on your website that you can like download. You want to kind of touch base yeah. on that? Yeah, 
Yeah. I, I, I created like a little quarantine cookbook because, um, people were like, you know, they weren't ordering out, they weren't going out, they didn't know what to do. And it was just supposed to be like comfort, easy meals. And I made it free. You can get it on my website and download it. And the website is monavan.com, right? Yes. Monavan.com. Perfect. Mm -hmm. So I, I, on, on, uh, there's two things I want to do on a closing note. I don't want to take up too much of your mm -hmm. time. I'm going to do a little rapid fire, just a few questions, but also sure. uh, a little bit more about the Persian aspect. You know, like I, I saw in one of your posts last year on my birthday, actually May 31st, you, um, you, you put a post about how you were looking for like a Farsi tutor and how this is like the fir fourth time that you're looking for somebody to kind of like uh, reteach your Farsi. Tell us um, how much like Farsi you kind of know. And then how did that go? Did you end up getting a tutor? Or are you kind of like picking up the Farsi aspect? You know, it's so fun because there's so many things I feel like I've accomplished and done well. And this is just something I, it's so hard for me. Every time I start, something comes up in life where, and I'm like, I wonder what there, there's clearly a block in my body or mind or something for, I don't know why. And I used to speak Farsi fluently when I lived in Iran. Mm. Um, when my parents divorced, they both remarried Americans. And, you know, my mom, my brother still sp speaks because my grandmother on my dad's side lived with them in LA. So I completely forgot. And it's just been this really sensitive topic for me. Um, every time, I mean, I get triggered so easily just to be totally like okay. every time around my family and everyone's speaking Farsi and I can't, I want to have like meaningful conversations with my grandparents, not just, you know, How's, I miss you. How are you? What'd you have for dinner? Like, you know, I want to actually know them. So it's really hard for me. And then I think it's all, it was also hard when I wanted to make more Persian friends when I moved to LA and I, you know, it's like almost like you feel a little bit like an outsider. Mm -hmm. um, so it's one of those things that I'm like, I, I still hope that one day I do it. It's still one of my goals, but I haven't gotten there yet. So, so would you say that like you basically don't you you only understand a little bit but you don't speak it at all i, I generally don't know how your capacity i speak a little i speak a little i understand a good amount when i spend like a week with my family i mean it multiplies yeah and i think i'm always like i wish i could live in iran for a month and yeah. and really learn you know what when um, was the last time you were in iran was it when you were one year old yeah when i was three, three. um <clears throat> haven't been back i'm scared to go back I don't want to get stuck. Well, yeah, I mean, trust me, me too. Uh, but definitely you for sure. But l let me say something if it means anything. Uh, one Please. thing that, that made me want to reach out to you and have you as a guest on this podcast is because even on your IG bio, you proudly mention Persian, you know, and so and, and, and on multiple posts, you know, you mentioned it again. I'm very surprised that I didn't know you didn't speak that much. And good for you that even though you don't speak it for whatever the circumstances are, that it's still a part of you that you're proudly sharing because there's a lot of people that speak fluent and they understand fluent or whatever, but they don't make any mention of it. But for you to have such a massive platform and to proudly put up the Persian flag, whatever flag it is, um, from afar, that, that to me speaks a lot more than your ability to f speak it fluently or understand it fluently. So kudos to you. And I think you're Thank awesome you. for that. And I appreciate you considering to come on a quote unquote Persian podcast to, to share your story, because now I even have more respect and admire what you've been doing even more. So awesome. Oh, that, that was so nice. That made me feel really nice. Thank you. I think our culture is so beautiful. It, like, I just, I'm so proud. Like, it's almost like my biggest flex. I love, I love Persian, you know, I love it. Yeah, I love our music. I love our, I love everything about it. So I'm so proud to be Persian. Uh, do you, and, and I'm sorry if I haven't seen the videos yet, but do you kind it's of okay. like integrate some Persian stuff, some Persian food and stuff here? And oh there? yeah. I have um, like, I'll do like Persian vegan recipes. I was vegan for a long time. I'm not anymore, okay. but I would do Persian vegan recipes. I do, I have funny videos with my mom where she's like trying to order me something and, you know, her, like, you know, just playfully making fun of her accent. It's so cute. Um, and I love, I love incorporating, but just, you know, as much as I can. Well, I, like a couple of my friends, they're, they're the organizers of the big Instagram pages, like the Persian one and then Persian memes official. If you ever yes. make a Persian one, let me know. I'll make sure that they share it. So you connect more with Persians. Cause I, now that I'm talking to you, it seems like you'd love to connect more even into the yes. Persian community and you'd love to kind of connect and just the, the, the connectivity will reach, will lead to more speaking and more understanding and just more enjoying 
about our history. That's why I do this. I do it because I want to connect with more Persians uh, because we're not in our homeland. We don't speak our mother language day to day with everybody. So it's important for us. You know, that's literally the entire, the entire purpose of Unite and Conquer and the Awesome People podcast is to bring us all together. There's a couple million Iranians like you and I who don't have that connection with our motherland. And so this is the next best thing. So might as well do a kick-ass job and, and build this community and bring us through together through good food, good music, good health uh, suggestions, and whatever else we can think of, or just talking about these challenges, you know, these shortcomings that, not shortcomings, but these voids in our life, you know, but we can, yes. we can fill them up with other great things, you know, like new friendships like this right here. Exactly. I was, I mean, I, I love connecting with Persians and I, I did a few podcasts today and this was my favorite one. Cause it's oh, just such, you know, there's just you. like an instant connection with other Persians and thank you. Yeah, I hope I actually hope to connect with more in New York because in LA there's so many in New York City I haven't met as many so hopefully I do connect with more. Awesome. Well, if you're ever in DC or Miami, let me know and we'll we'll roll out the Persian carpet for you. You know, and love it. <laughs> um, okay, so we're gonna finish it up with a little bit of rapid fire. I was hoping to add more things to it, but I didn't get a chance. Um, okay. First of all, LA or NYC? NYC. Well, let's just say why. <laughs> um, I used to be LA obsessed, but there was something about the rawness and realness of New York city. Um, that just, I, I really like connect to now. And you've gone through a I full like winter in New York too, right? The, I'm three years in now, okay. you know, cause COVID kind of made it a little, you know, yeah. I hated it the first few months. I was like, it's so ugly and old and I miss the sun. And, and then all of a sudden you just appreciate it. And like, I like connection. I really like connecting with people. And I find that the, in New York, it's a little bit easier than LA. Well, and, and now that hopefully COVID is starting to be on the way out, you're going to hopefully really experience the amazingness of New York City. I've never lived oh, yeah. there, but I've, as a D.C. or Washingtonian for 30 years, I've done enough trips. And it's an incredible, powerful, uh, strongly connected city. Like once you become a New Yorker, again, I wouldn't know, but I've, I've heard people, you know, it's a whole different, it's a family. It's a big family of 12 oh, people. Oh, people are like they like love their city like now i get it i'm like okay i understand yeah for sure <laughs> um name one superfood to integrate and one shitty food to eliminate love this a superfood to integrate um broccoli sprouts mm. broccoli yeah. sprouts um because they're sprouts um it's almost like you think of a kid going through um like you know when your kid's going through like a growth spurt mm -hmm. and picture everything like all, everything like multiplying it's like almost like all the nutrients are extra packed because they're growing so people will add broccoli sprouts or broccoli seeds into like their smoothies or anything and it's kind of one of those amazing superfoods i love it um if you're going to eliminate something seed oils so any oil with safflower sunflower canola any of those seed oils noted what was your last cheat meal my last cheat meal 1990s. <laughs> you caught me at a weird time because I'm on a really specific regimen trying to work on my gut health, but I would say my last cheat meal, God, I don't even think about it. Probably like French fries, but I don't even consider it cheating because I don't do it that often. So I don't know. That, yeah. that was a hard one. Can I, I pass? Yeah, no, actually, you know, again, in another video, you actually mentioned how like the thought of going even into a fast food place doesn't even come to my mind because you have you have manipulated your brain in a good way to not even yes. think, not even go in that direction. So that's why it took you so long to figure out a cheat meal because for you, cheat meal is like, what the hell are you talking about? Because I'm like, when I make my own French fries at home, I don't consider it cheating. So like, it'd be like you yeah. doing something illegal. I don't know if you follow. Yeah. I mean, yeah. you know, I'm assuming you follow the law. So it's like not even on your mind, just yeah. no craving for it. So on that track, what is one daily non-negotiable for meditation every time an hour hour and a half to <laughs> no you know no sometimes i'll do 20 minutes yeah. but crazy enough if you would have asked me a year ago like 20 minutes was hard for me to do every day yeah um the hour actually is it's not hard for me it's not like i'm forcing myself through it as soon as i close my eyes it's like i'm there um but sometimes i'll do 20 minutes but i will not skip my meditation like i'd rather right. miss a deadline i'd rather not work out i don't care Good for you. That's incredible. Yeah. Um, what's what's one thing that you want everyone to know before we wrap this bad boy up? Uh, one thing I want everyone to know about me, or just in general. Just uh, you know, you you you've lived um, a life now that you've learned a lot, uh, you've experienced a lot. Um, 
and some almost like maybe a little bit of it. I know some people don't like to give advice, you know, but just something that right. is like an important thing that means something to you. And if anybody wants to listen to it and follow it, great. If not, whatever, you know. Yep. Um, I would say to really, really practice self-love and compassion and not be so hard on yourself. I think shifting the way you talk to yourself, shifting the way, you know, like once you, once you shift that, you you realize you're so conscious of like all the things like you used to say to yourself, like, God, I look so ugly or God, like well, I'm such an idiot or why would I do this? Or I'm, you know, get so mad at yourself or mistakes you make. And I've just learned how much the body hears. It even like hears your thoughts. Not even if you say it out loud, don't voice negative things about yourself. Don't think negative things about yourself. And if you do, you know, immediately say a new, like, you know what? That's not true. I'm actually amazing. I did the best I could. Um, practicing more self-love and just realizing that your mistakes, you were doing the best you could in that moment and just move on from it. Don't dwell on things that you think you did wrong. That's beautiful. I think really some people, they, they don't realize the power of mindset and really how you speak to yourself, how you respect yourself, how you love yourself uh, is, is so paramount and your ability to make it through this uh, beautiful thing called life, you know, so great um, advice. Appreciate that. Well, uh, Mona John, I, I genuinely appreciate you taking time to be a part of the Awesome People podcast. You truly are awesome. And even though you don't speak fluently, you are for sure one of my favorite awesome Persians. And I'm rooting for you. A lot of people are rooting Thank for you. A lot of Persians are rooting for you. And I'm going now that I, I got to know you a little better, I'm going to make sure that more Persians, they know just how awesome you are and they get to support you because people like you need to continue to get supported so that you can continue doing uh, what your life's mission is, you know, and that is to make uh, your community healthier and better. So let's turn this 2 million to 200 million and keep on kicking ass. You are great. Thank you so much for that. Thank Enjoy. you. And thank you to the ladies that help coordinate this. Wishing you guys all the best. And uh, till next time, take care. All right. Bye. Bye-bye. Khoda Hafiz. All right, ladies and gentlemen, that was wonderful. I greatly appreciate the the Big Apple, that was incredible. And uh, I don't know who my next guest will be, but it's going to be hard to top this one. This was a pleasure. And uh, I'm, I'm now even more motivated to be healthier moving forward. Uh, don't forget, if you're in the Miami area, Saturday, April 30th, Bokche, we're uniting modern day entrepreneurs, business professionals, and um, just really awesome Persians that are doing awesome things in the Miami area. Come to Miami Beach and let's hang out over great food, great music, great vibes. Let's support each other and let's continue to do amazing things to grow the Persian community in Southern Florida. Click the link in my bio for more information and tickets. Take care and uh, don't forget to click subscribe, click the bell. And if you're not following the Unite and Conquer YouTube channel, please do that as well. Much love to all of you for tuning in and for commenting and just being awesome. Take care and thank you Anush and Brandon for the help behind the scenes. Oh,